Live to see it, friends. You're listening to the Transparency Revolution Audio Edition. I'm Phil Bowermaster, and I'm pleased to welcome you to program number 44 in our ongoing exploration of issues related to career management, education, the workplace, and, of course, personal, organizational, and societal transparency. Today, we're going to revisit a topic that I've blogged about extensively on the Transparency Revolution blog, the role that automation is playing in transforming our economy and, in particular, changing the employment landscape. Our guest today is here to tell us that most analysis on this subject doesn't go nearly far enough, that technology is on the verge of creating what can only be described as an employment crisis, and that, in fact, robots are about to steal most of our jobs. Federico Pistono is a scientific educator, social activist, computer scientist, blogger, media expert, and aspiring filmmaker. He writes on a variety of topics, including science, technology, Internet communities, and social media, artificial intelligence, and climate change. Federico has formal education in science and technology with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from the University of Verona. He continued his studies by following courses at Stanford on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now in 2012, he's been accepted to the Graduate Studies Program at Singularity University at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. His forthcoming book is entitled, Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, How to Survive the Economic Collapse and Be Happy. Federico, welcome to the Transparency Revolution. Thank you. Well, we're uh, really pleased to have you with us, and I want to just jump right into this subject. So you posted this essay on the IWET site, and for listeners who aren't familiar, that's the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And this piece has the same title as your book, Robots Will Steal Your Job, etc. And here you argue that technology, which to my mind has always been both a great creator and destroyer of jobs, is about to move primarily into the destroyer mode. Uh, explain why you think that's the case. Okay, so thank you for having me first. And the the article that I just wrote is uh, actually part of a series, so uh, I will be probably writing three articles. Uh, the first one focusing on the economic collapse, the second on the relationship between employment and uh, happiness, and the third one will be about solutions. So on this first one, I concentrated on the what I think will be the upcoming economic collapse due to structural unemployment, also called um, technological unemployment. So what's the difference between you know just normal unemployment and technological employment or structural one? The thing is, we as a society, whenever we introduce the new technology, we were able to utilize this technology as a propelling force, propelling force to move forward with development and uh, higher standards of living and also creating different jobs. So different sectors were created, you know, at the beginning of the last century, most of the people, like way over 90% work on the agricultural sector. But then as we move forward, we created the manufacturing sector and then the service sector, and now we are having the boom on the internet and uh, social media, and you know, the next one will probably be synthetic biology and biochemistry and all sorts of things that are connected with computer science and, and biology. Um, but the thing is, we are on the verge of a catastrophic change and shift in, in, in society, specifically in our economic model, uh, because we are displacing jobs faster than we can replace them. And, this, and, and the new jobs that are created are highly technical, highly specialized. They require a lot of flexibility, ingenuity, and also a lot of education, which is hard to get. And most of the people who are, let's say, the baby boomers generation, uh, I don't, they will not be able to become you know, biochemists in two years because that takes time and takes lots of mental flexibility. So we are going to replace most of the jobs that are on the manufacturing sector, but also some of the service sector jobs. As it, I mean, It's already happening, but it will become more and more uh, prevalent. And the new technologies that we will utilize after, you know, this, this so we are, we are building new technologies every day. And the day, the day after that, we're going to use the last technologies that we, that we created. And this creates an exponential trend, which then propels the new technology revolution 
And as a result of that, um, well, we're just going to have to kind of rethink the way we structure things because the cycle of employment for, I mean, labor for income and then spending your income for getting your goods and services uh, is probably not going to work out because people will not have jobs and therefore will not have an income to begin with. So I, I think we, we have to rethink the structure before it's too late and things turn really bad. Hmm, okay. Well, we had the economist Arnold Kling on the program uh, about uh, t about two months ago, and Kling said uh, he described this as the loss of uh, – talking about a very similar kind of pattern to what you just described – talked about it as the loss of middle-class jobs. He, he talked about uh, the, the kind of um, – uh, clerical work, the kind of um, you know, not the not the very top of the uh, food chain necessarily, not the bottom, but really all the, the the big middle that's being sort of eaten out of the eaten out of the job market uh, in in the very near future. Would 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 you agree with that assessment? Who or, or let me put it this way: Who do you think is at the greatest risk currently? What are the jobs or the categories of jobs that are disappearing now and that are going to be disappearing the most rapidly in the in the next few years? Yeah, I think in the next five to ten years we're going to see it disappear. Most of the jobs related to, uh, and I took this from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2001 in the United States, so it's very recent data. Right now we have about 13% uh, per of all the workers working on the office and administrative support. It's about 18 million people. And then you have like 16 million working on production, transportation, and material moving. Now, we already have automated cars that are running better and faster and more reliable than the best human drivers. So, you know, taxi drivers, truck drivers, those kind of, they're, they're, they're going. They're going away and they're not coming back. And those millions of truck drivers and taxi drivers and uh, people working on transportation and material moving, they're going to be replaced by artificial intelligence, robots, and all sorts of mm, intricate um, mixes of, of the two things and well the same goes for production it will be much cheaper it, is, it already is much cheaper for, for companies to automate when it's large scale but right now with you know new advances such as 3D printing you don't have to inject mold uh, millions and millions of, <laughs> of products to become right. actually right so, so it, it becomes profitable even with very very small uh, scale production. Actually, it, it, it's better for people because it's cheaper and it's more customizable. So, and this thing just, those jobs are going away. And construction and extraction, that's another 7 million people, 5% of the workers' population in the United States. Uh, building and grass cleaning, maintenance, 3.85%, it's more than 5 million people. Uh, most of the jobs are going away. Even, even highly skilled jobs that one might think, such as the lawyers. Well, we have 1.7 million lawyers in the United States. That's, one, that's over 1.2% of the population. It's a lot of lawyers. Well, already we are seeing lots and lots of lawyers being automated. They have, law, uh, they have companies where they, you know, they used to have 50 lawyers in there, and others just maybe five or six, and they are using automated software to manage most of the uh, legal issues because well, in the end, if you just think about what you know a lawyer does in most cases, you know I'm not talking about the kind of moral standpoint, and there are just a very few percent, you know, there's a small percentage of the uh, huge number of cases that lawyers have to deal with. Uh, in most cases, it's just it's just bureaucracy, data crunching, and well, it's impossible for a human to keep up with all the new laws that are you know, brought up every day in every state and all the granularity that you can think of. So it's just, it's just mind-blowing for a human to, to deal with that. And the software does it very efficiently, doesn't need any medical attention, doesn't need any, um, you know, workers' rights. Uh, they, they don't have unions, so they don't need... Sure, doesn't take vacation, absolutely. Right, so, doesn't get yeah, confused, is, yeah. to, you know, after it's worked too many hours or any, any of those issues that you that you deal with with a regular human yeah. employee. Well, you know, when you say this, it, something occurred to me. I put a piece up on one of my other blogs the other day about the 
BMW 5 Series uh, prototype that uh, they, they've recently put out, uh, running on the Autobahn, auto driving. Uh, it's very similar to the the test that uh, that Google has been running over the past few years. And one of the statements that BMW has made is that they don't anticipate bringing a product like this to production, making them widely available for another 10 or 15 years. So if yeah, you, if, yeah. if you figure that if, if that time frame is right, and even if say uh, market forces force BMW and others to, uh, to to go to production with something like that, even even a bit sooner than that, if you're a taxi driver right now, you might have another you know 10, 15, maybe even 20 years before your your, your job is automated. Whereas if you're a lawyer, you're, you're getting automated out of out of work right now. So maybe uh, maybe it's not the middle class jobs that are in in the greatest danger. Maybe it's uh, it's it's some of the uh, what we would think of as higher level type jobs that uh, that are that are more information centric. Well, certainly there is there, there, you know there is a big misconception among general population that think that automation will lead to the disappearance of only the um, unskilled jobs, mm -hmm. and that that is certainly the case in a time frame where robotics um, you know becomes um, reliable and cheap and flexible, which isn't the case right now, but it's it's getting there, but the software is much more advanced than the hardware. So it's easier to automate a, a radiologist who takes you know, 15 years of studying and training, and you can automate it with a software that a few computer scientists and a couple of biologists and uh, neuroscientists can do in like four months. So the power of computation and algorithms is much greater than the power of the roboticist, just because it's harder to deal with physical stuff. Right. But it's, it's getting there. But the thing is, I would argue that, that the prediction made by BMW is highly unrealistic. And, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll take my chances with that. But the thing is, if Toyota or other companies in a couple of years come out with a, you know, prototype car, which actually gets into the market and they have a few thousand or a few hundreds of thousands of models coming out, then they're, you know, in order to be competitive, they're going to have to push the technology. They're going to have to develop new systems and make it cheaper. So the whole thing will just drive itself, literally. <laughs> so it will drive the market, and it will drive itself as the car will drive itself. So um, the 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 ten-year prediction in in exponential times is like saying 500 years in linear times or a thousand years. So it, it makes no sense to me to speak about 15 years from now it, it, to say that a technology that already works today will be kind of available 15 years from now if it, if it follows a, an exponential trend. And I want to make this distinction very clear. Now, I'm not saying that every technology follows an exponential path, right? right. So, some, so some skeptics would argue, oh, look at fusion, right? It's Every, every 10 years, they say, oh, the next 10 years, oh, in the next 10 years, we'll manage fusion. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll do fusion in the next 10 years. And we, we've been, we've been, years. yeah, we've been 10, actually, I, I always hear 20. We've been 20 years away from fusion my entire life. Right? Yeah, That's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, fusion will probably still be an unresolved problem 20 years from now, just because it doesn't follow an exponential trend. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Automated cars, they do. Um, Computer science, obviously it does. Uh, now medicine is becoming an, exponential an exponentially expanding technology because computer science is being inserted into that. Fusion has, well, almost nothing to do with computer science. It has to do with uh, lots of problems with, uh, you know, uh, decay of, uh, neuron decay and atoms and uh, moving from, from one state to the other. And it, it's, it's a highly complex problem and they haven't been able to, to find a solution for more than 60 years. And, you know, I just read an article from a uh, professor of physics, uh, uh, Tom Murphy, and, you know, he has very good reasons to think that we want, um, you know, for the, for, for the next 20 or 25 years, or so the foreseeable futures, future, we won't see any um, fusion technology uh, commercial available. And, uh, and there, there is a very good ground for that because it doesn't follow an exponential trend. But the technologies that do, they will, they will completely change within five to, to ten years. So to, to say that in 15 years we won't have automated cars running around, I think it's just ridiculous. Now, 
the, the thing is, there is um, social acceptance of the technology. I was just about to ask you because sometimes that occurs occurs on an exponential curve, and then so, sometimes not. Uh, what, what what happens if society is resistant to the idea of a of a self driving car? Or I can imagine a scenario where we have self driving cars, but legally. It, it'll still yeah. be required that a cab driver is sitting there in the yeah. uh, in, in the car, yeah. something and like I that. Make, I make that case in the in the book. There is a chapter called "The History of Self-Driving Cars" or a possible history of self-driving cars, where you know I, I make the argument that it's not like Kurzweil says it. it you know, he makes it he makes the argument as if it's very simple. Obviously, he's um, purposely purposefully simplifying it, mm -hmm. but he says you know. A technology, once it follows an exponential path, it will just go inexorably towards its path. And I don't think that's the case because it's slowed down by social acceptance. So you're going to have technophobes, you're going to have some car manufacturers or just uh, people who don't want this kind of thing happening. They will try to keep it from preventing it from happening. But in the end, they will just procrastinate the, ine the inevitable. So instead of five years, maybe it will take six or seven, but it will not take 50. So they're just slowing it down a bit, but it's completely inevitable. I, I would tend to agree it's inevitable. It'll be really interesting to see what the uh, what the time frame will be. Well, listen, I blogged about your essay earlier this week, and I compared your assessment of this particular situation with that of Walter Russell Mead. He's been doing a series of blog posts about the future of the economy over at the American Interest. And Mead paints a picture of an economy in transition, but the unemployment picture isn't nearly as bleak or, I guess, as dramatic as what you described. So let me, I'm, I'm going to read just a little bit from one of his essays, and then uh, I'll, I'll ask you a question and give you a chance to respond. Here's, here's what Mead writes. He writes, people do not run out of wants and needs when they have enough food, enough clothing, enough shelter, and enough warmth. In fact, liberated from the constraints of the struggle for survival, the human imagination discovers new wants and needs at a faster pace as the old ones are met and forgotten. This hunger for new, richer, and more interesting lives ensures that we can all keep making a living, and it ensures that we will also want to keep working so as to afford all the cool new services and experiences being created around us. As long as humanity keeps wanting, humanity can make a living satisfying wants and creating new ones. And then he goes on to argue that the new economy will be based on personal services, and he outlines a massive new opportunities opening up in what he calls lifestyle industries. These are jobs like massage therapist and chef and landscaper and dance instructor, things that robots might not be able to do very effectively, at least, at least not for a while yet. He claims that these jobs will become much more numerous and higher paying following the same arc that manufacturing jobs did when that sector first took off a, a, a century or more ago. So I got two questions for you here. One, if Mead is correct, wouldn't that pretty much solve the problem? And two, can we really say with any certainty that he's right or not? Well, I can't say with any certainty. That's obvious. Can, can you respond to the idea of th these, uh, these, these lifestyle industries, the idea that the, the people will be providing, as he describes it, individualized kinds of services uh, to each other, and, and you know uh, the, the ones I listed are dance instructors and massage therapists. But there's a, there's a whole class of these these kinds of things. I, I think the real question is, can you can you base an economy on that sort of thing? Well, I think you can, and it, something like that certainly will happen. But the the question isn't can we base an economy on that. I think the question is how should we go about in organizing our lifestyles. So if if people don't need to work in order to survive. Because right now there are literally people starving to death, even in highly developed countries. Uh, you have millions of homeless people in the United States, even though there are m many more millions of uh, empty houses, which is ridiculous and insane, and you know socially degrading. But the thing is, if well, if you don't have to work to survive, then what you do might not be work. It might be something that you just like to do, right? Something that you do because it's fun to do, right. because it drives you. So I think we have to redefine what we mean by work and jobs and occupation. So obviously service kind of things will be, will be big, but not because people have to do them, but because people would like to do them. And maybe, you know, people like to do more things and experiment and try out. And so one could change occupation every year or maybe keep the same for 20 years. It doesn't matter because you're not required 
to. And if you don't do that, they're, you know, you're going to starve to death and you're not going to have um, energy and food and, on your table. That's not going to happen if we change the way we think about occupation and work and jobs. And, you know, it, it will be like a voluntary economy or a, um, I, wanna, I, I don't want to use the word hobby because hobby is kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, it's not really serious, but a drive purpose economy or something like that. Yeah, people, people, doing, people pursuing their, their passion, people pursuing their bliss. I, I love that idea. Well, let me tell you, I've, I've talked a couple of times with Martin Ford, and I, I know you're familiar with, with his book, uh, Lights in the Tunnel, which, which talks about some of, these, some of these same issues. Now, Ford argues for some pretty massive restructuring of society uh, along the lines of uh, things you were, you were suggesting or hinting at uh, a moment ago. And, and he talks about ultimately there being a system of direct government payment to individuals. Now, would you say that those are the kinds of solutions that you talk about in, in your book or... Um, Actually, let me put let me put it more simply than that. Um, why is it going to be okay, and how is it in the long run that you know, without spoiling your whole book for us, how is it that we're we're going to end up being happy? Okay. Well, first of all, I um, I read uh, Martin Ford's book and I thought it was I thought it was really good, especially the first part. Where I diverge strongly is the solutions proposed. Okay. As you mentioned, he proposes a government intervention in most things. Actually, actually, I remember this passage where he proposes to that the government should pay people to read so, so that they won't slack off. They will keep themselves occupied and learn new things. And, well, it makes sense in the kind of mindset that we live in today because you never do anything unless it's for money. But I think it's completely corrupt and, well, it's ludicrous that to, to think that we can propel our species forward if we keep the, the money motivation as the primary force for uh, people to do stuff, which scientific research shows that actually money hinders motivation and innovation at the highest levels, where you need creativity, where you need um, you know, to, to, to develop your creative self. Money hinders that kind of ability, and it's been proven over and over again. So I think that to answer your question, the uh, but it's okay part is, if we think about society and our relationship with it, meaning how we, you know, how we consider work and jobs, and if, if we perceive it in a different way, in a kind of society where, where, where we think about not economic growth or kind of jobs we have or more, more jobs and more activities and new occupations, but if we think about quality of life and gross national happiness and those kind of things that were kind of introduced about you know three to four decades ago, but very very few people are talking about. Then you're going to have to see a massive change in the way we in the way we interact with each other, in the way we create new things, and um, the giving the ability and the opportunity for people to pursue their dreams, to study, to learn, to play music, to become filmmakers and actors and uh, thinkers and philosophers and biochemists and you know wh whatever they think they want to do without the co constant worrying of oh my god am I going to make it you know until the end of the month if that worry kind of goes away because we can produce abundance through automation then we're going to see a whole different universe exploration I mean it, it, it will be catastrophically um, a, a massive change in our perception of reality and also in what we can achieve as a species. And from that point, I think it will be the first time where we can actually call ourselves a civilization, where nobody's starving and anyone can pursue their dreams for real, not just wishful thinking. Well, I, I, love, I love that imagery. Um, very, very fond of uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, vast, uh, abundance-based, um, transformed economy how do you get there from here though that's the that's that's the question in in the model you just described who's
providing all the stuff to people? Is it uh, is it the you know have the machines taken over? Is that post singularity? Is there is there a government that's running it and making sure that everything's being manufactured and stuff's being handed out? Do people have their own 3D printers and their own manufacturing infrastructure and they're making their their own stuff? I mean, how do you how do you get to this world where um, not only is there enough of everything, but everybody's getting what they need and then they're able to uh, pursue their pursue their bliss? Yeah, well, I, I don't have a crystal ball, so I you know, can predict the future, but I think right. it's going to be a combination of many different factors, but especially the DIY technology. Mm-hmm. So that you kind of do it yourself, decentralized, open source, that will be the, the real driving force, because we're moving away from the institutionalized, uh, kind of, you know, top to bottom approach of everything is concentrated and a few people control all of that. Now, technology is enabling a couple of kids in a, in a dorm, in a college or a, uh, you know, the, the garage or somewhere to become, 10 years ago, the new Google and Facebook. And in 10 years' time, it will to become the new biogeneticists and uh, synthetic biologists. So these kind of things will completely revolutionize our way of thinking. And I think projects like open source ecology uh, which is growing exponentially. They started four years ago, and they, they want to build the 50 machines that will be sufficient to create a from scratch an entire new civilization with modern comforts. Now they started four years ago, and now they have uh, just a couple of months ago they had six machines, six prototypes working. Now in just three months they already built seven more of them, and they expect to to build all 50 of them by the end of the year because they got more than, uh, I think, $2 million in donations. And now this thing, you know, which it took four years to build six machines, now to build the remaining uh, 46 machines or 44 machines is going to take just, you know, nine months. And the reason for that is it's following an exponential trend. Um, the, 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 the speed of growth of a graph, you know, is is proportional to the, uh, well, it grows exponentially with the number of nodes connected to it. So by, by utilizing this distributed technology, which is the internet, connected with moving from the, physic- from, from the digital bits of computers to the physical bits of stuff and matter, then we can create the, the really new industrial revolution. As Jeremy Rifkin puts it, you know, to create the third industrial revolution, which will be this distributed, open source, DIY kind of thing. So I think that will be the, the main driving force. But of course, you know, there will be also be some corporations and government involved and uh, private sector. The, the whole thing will just, you know, mix together in a unpredictable way, kind of chaos, chaos theory thing that, you know, nobody can, can say for sure. But I would bet my, I would bet my, my time, not my money. The money will be kind of I don't know, less and less relevant. I don't think money will disappear anytime soon, but I think it will become less relevant as more people uh, become um, less dependent on the need for money and more dependent on the need for community, for finding their purpose, for um, human relations, and those kind of things, which are really what what give us what give us meaning. Well, ultimately, it seems to me that... Um that if money disappears, what what remains is the, um, the 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 piece that has kind of driven us to this point to now. Anyway, for for, for which money is the uh, is is the arbiter, which is the um, transaction for value, right? That's that's what uh, kind of if if you read a, a book like uh, the Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley, he, he talks about essentially all of you know the, the story of human evolution. You know, from from uh, hunter gatherer days through civilization to technology to today, uh, gets gets kicked into motion by the fact that we're that, that our ideas are, as he says, at having sex with each other. That we're exchanging uh, we're exchanging value with each other. Um, yeah. You know, I'm I'm producing something that's a little bit better than what you would be able to produce for yourself. You're doing the same thing, and so we're swapping those things. And then money created this kind of in, you know this prototype of an information technology that made it possible for people to do massive transactions uh, uh, of of value between each other. Well, ultimately, if you get to the point where the 
um, that kind of symbolic representation of value d doesn't matter as much anymore. You'll still have people, I think, uh, interacting with each other and transacting with each other, and, and maybe at that point it's more it's more nearly just purely ideas that are that are being shared and transacted. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I think the, I think money should be considered just as another piece of technology, which is subject to the laws of you know technology, which is technology becomes you know ripe and then it grows and it's useful and then maybe it becomes kind of obsolete and then it's phased out and replaced by another technology which is more efficient and better and faster and works uh, just it just fits the time the zeitgeist of, of your time right so I, I think money has done its has done its you know has, has been a, a huge drive has been a good thing for the past and now it's kind of you know it's kind of getting less and less relevant and maybe we'll stay for another you know, I don't know how much but I think money is becoming replaced by ideas by sh sharing of knowledge by the um, kind of drive that people have as you see like Wikipedia and Apache and Linux and open source college these kind of things creative commons there is no exchange of money mostly it's an exchange of Information, yeah. People yeah. are people are sharing their ideas with each other. Exactly. exactly. All right. So I know we're getting very close on the amount of time that you and I had allotted to talk together. I, I want to I, I want to get to one one last question. Recognizing that you don't have a crystal ball, um, if uh, if you think that uh, BMW's estimate of 15 years is 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 wildly inaccurate uh, on on the long side, what's your best estimate for when we'll see the complete transition? away from um, the existing sort of employment-based economy to a sort of, I, I guess we can call it a post-employment-based economy. When do you see that happening? Oh, wait. Uh, was BMW referring just to automated cars or to... I was just referring cars? to that timeline that we had talked about earlier, yeah, for the automated cars, yes. Oh, for the automated cars. Well, I don't know about the full transition because, you know, just look at the Internet. It's not even, it's not even 5 billion people or I think it's like three and a half billion people connected to the internet. So the full transition, the, the, the last part is always the hardest. But what I'm interested in is, um, let's say 50%, right? So 50% already is a disruptive number to change the, the whole industry. And I think that that could happen within five to 10 years easily if there is, there is, there is not so much social hindrance to, to kind of stop this process. Um, but who knows? I could be wrong, and then you know, in five, in ten years' time, you'll say, "Ah, oh, you said ten years. We are still behind." And say, "Yeah, whatever." But uh, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that this thing will will take off pretty fast. Well, one one thing that I've I've observed is uh, amongst ourselves, us futurists are are very good about forgetting each other's time frames and predictions. I think it's a it's it's an important professional <laughs> courtesy that we uh, that, that we extend to each other. Well. Uh, Federico, I thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Once again, I'm going to say the name of the book is Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, How to Survive the Economic Collapse and Be Happy. We'll have links to that on the transparency revolution. All the best to you, Federico, and let's, uh, let's look forward to uh, having you back on the program and talking again sometime in the near future. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, thank you. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Transparency Revolution. Thanks for joining us. We value your comments. Please leave them at transparencyrevolution.com.